You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy. We have an episode with more crypto news than you can fit in a Bitcoin block, featuring Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Zcash on episode 199 here on March 22nd, 2017. In the, in the traditional markets, we have gold up to $1,248, silver's up to $17.51, oil's down to $48.13, the Dow is down to 20,661 points, and the 30 year Treasury yield is down to 3.017%. And in the crypto markets, we've got Bitcoin down to $1,015. Ethereum rises to $40.57. Dash returns to $99. Zcash is up to $65.40. Monero is up to $20.70. Wow. Thank you so much, Randy and Darren. And just a reminder that you can tune in to Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single mode of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, LBRY and more. In fact, thank you, YouTube, uh, for listening. Last week, we had uh, over 700 downloads, and uh, that was a tremendous week. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. We had a nice week last week. And joining us here uh, is Pedro once again. Pedro, thank you so much for being on the show again. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. That's the audience clapped. Yes. The the live us us audience. Yeah, please clap. (laughs) So, Pedro, uh, you've got some stuff you want to talk about, too. Um, we're just going to lead out with a, uh, our first story here because I think this is something pretty interesting. Uh, Randy, you've got some IRS news. Only 893 people have declared Bitcoin for tax purposes, according to the IRS. Uh, there was an article that was put up today on uh, Bitcoin.com. Basically, the, there were new documents that were filed in federal court last Thursday in San Francisco. Uh, apparently, the IRS found less than 1,000 people had filed a Form 8480, which they claim would account for a property description likely related to Bitcoin. They said 807 people reportedly filed in 2013, 893 in 2014, and 802 in 2015. Now, we've, we've talked about this before. Uh, the IRS had demanded that Coinbase uh, give them private customer information and detailed transaction records from every single Coinbase account. Uh, Coinbase has pledged to fight this blanket, quote, John Doe summons. Um, so basically, they're saying that there, there's no precedent for demanding this kind of information about every single user, um, just because they allege that certain people are evading tax purposes or, or, or evading uh, filing taxes. So we've also talked about how difficult... Uh, people who are seeking advice, how how difficult it's been for people seeking advice to actually be able to file uh, their tax reports. Back in episode 182, uh, we talked about a 31-page report from the U.S. Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration that had basically summarized a nine-month audit that that the IRS had done um, over virtual currencies. So there were questions from the public seeking guidance on how to comply with tax regulations, and they found that many times these questions went unanswered. And uh, that the most common forms, 1099s and W-2s, have no place for virtual currencies to be reported. Um, the, wow. Uh, yeah. So, so so basically, they're they're expecting people to comply, but they're not not making it easy at all. Right. So they're not even explaining what that means. Yeah. To and, comply. And right. bec- because the IRS. Uh, st- recognizes Bitcoin as property rather than currency, they claim it's subject to capital gains tax. So let's say you're using Bitcoin as a currency, if you're using it to purchase coffee or anything like that, the IRS wants you to keep track of which portion of which Bitcoin you use and what you paid for that Bitcoin when you bought it and how much it was worth in U.S. dollars at the time, or your, well, yeah, U.S. dollars uh, at the time you spend it. Yeah, so imagine if you had to do that for every dollar bill you had. You had to, like, write down the serial number and what day you got it on and what it was worth against some other value. It, it Obviously, it's 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 a lot. So um, It's just, well, here's the thing. It's, like, undoable almost. I don't know how someone's going to do that. I mean, Bitcoin is a, a very uh, fungible currency. You know, you have Bitcoins in your wallet. You move them. You don't know exactly which Bitcoin, per se. And I don't, I mean... Well, They're not I, exactly I think, serialized, are they? No, I mean, they can be divided up uh, uh, several, several times, and they can be merged together, and uh, and there's always that change that comes out of a transaction. Right. So, so. I mean, it, it, it's it's almost like they're asking an impossible request, basically saying it's outlawed, right? Like, you can't use this, you can't comply with our laws, well, because we're the, asking you to do something that will require you to be magical. And the other frustrating thing is that IRS sees it one way, FinCEN sees it another That's way. Right. And well, many other countries have come out with a single unified 
you know, s- standard of how they're going to regulate and how you how you need to do things to, to be in compliant, which, um, you know, I wish those things weren't there, but at, at least there's guidance and, and you can follow it if, if you're there, which really puts the, the crypto business here in the U.S. at a disadvantage. Sure. Well, um, I also, uh, 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 well, I mean, also, if you follow this, they, they classify, the IRS classifies uh, Bitcoin as property. Mm-hmm. So therefore, when you buy that cup of coffee, Aren't you in barter? And I've actually looked up, isn't that uh, barter? You're trading property for property. I'm trading you property, Bitcoin, for mm-hmm. property, coffee. And if you look up their rules on barter, um, you're supposed to say, well, if I sell you a book for $3, but it's really worth two fifty, I'm supposed to report two fifty. But the way things are priced in Bitcoin, if I pay for that coffee that's worth four fifty, they charge me four fifty worth of Bitcoin, right? That's the way things are priced in Bitcoin. So... As a barter transaction, shouldn't there be nothing to report there? That's, I mean, <laughs> that's some great, great point to bring up there. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I would be inclined to agree with that. I, I mean, mean, and then it basically throws out the, the IRS's the claims in the first place. Property, so this is clearly barter. This no, is not my my understanding is for um, you know things like when you trade between cryptocurrencies, you don't need to track uh, your gain and loss there. Well, you just need to track when it went from currency to a crypto, and then when it went out. You know, back to until they change that, until they yeah. change their minds on that. When it's like, oh, wait a minute, we're we're missing out on how much? Uh, yeah, well, I, I I don't know the rules, and you should check with your accountant on everything. But uh, that's it, right. It seems like the uh, the um, well, tax season the is upon us. There is exactly what you're doing. So yeah, yeah, we're not giving, we're not advising that you you either claim your Bitcoin uh, this tax season or not. We're not. That's yeah. not what this is about. We're, we're, we're simply talking about how. The uh, the system in place is almost meant to make it so that you can't Comply. actually follow through, right? So that you just you you've broken the rules from the get go. And even professional professionals have a difficult time understanding. Sure. Well, what? and and basically, uh, what was left from our last conversation about this was that the IRS was going to be creating a quote virtual currency strategy that was going to be coordinated across all of their divisions uh, by the end of September of this year. Um, they've also previously said though that changing their forms to quote capture virtual currency amounts is not a priority at this time citing tight funding. So, right, tight funding. But uh, we'll be seeing more from them at the end of September. This may be a big year where they do change uh, a lot of their focus, and certainly if cryptocurrencies so, keep getting the press attention they're getting... So they don't have the forms... That they can't make the forms so they actually apply to your situation, but they can fund the people to get all this information and send out the letters and do all that. And do all the legal shenanigans yes, too. It's it's they can't make it easy. On maybe the front they're end, misallocating so got- their funds. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well we've got so much more to talk about, gentlemen, and, and let's get it to the, some of the next uh, crypto news here. Uh so over uh, since this, since the our last episode, there uh, was a joint letter issued regarding the coming what I want to call the coming hard fork of Bitcoin. So several exchanges wrote a letter and they they uh, declared that the Bitcoin Core implementation of the code would forever be known as BTC or XBT, and the Bitcoin Unlimited implementation would be referred to as BTU or XBU. The list contains such names as Bitfinex, BTCC, Kraken, and Shapeshift, but absent are power players like Coinbase, BitPay, Huobi. And OKCoin. Okay hey, could we check the facts on that shapeshift? I think Eric has said he'll go with the majority. Well, he's, I mean, his his logo is represented there with the thing, oh, and, and I okay. haven't I have seen like any. Well, uh, he I, he has come out later on Twitter and said that that actually the article or that the document has, okay. was amended. I see. After some of them signed, wow. That, that in the long run, that he and Shapeshift would give BTC to whatever had the majority hash chain. Uh, right. Well, I mean, that brings up that's actually brings up the question is that in the event, and now I'm saying that I think it's going to be inevitable that that there will be some hard fork, and we'll get to why in the next story. But if a hard fork happens, like like would happen with Ether, yeah, I'm going to call it a chain fork. Okay, it's a fork in the chain. If you have two different branches, yes, then it's a chain. I'll just call it chain fork. Chain fork. Okay. So if a chain fork happens and you're left with two different chains. Uh, the majority chain or the, the chain with the bigging the biggest hashing power right. would 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 you call that the I would what would you call that I would call that the 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 kind of basically the smart one to go with and I I think this is pretty reasonable you have people that are very ideologically in favor of one or the other 
But honestly, if you go with the majority hashing power, that's going to be the most secure. There's always going to be a chance that the majority chain could try to attack the minority chain. Not that I recommend it. And I don't even think it's possible or don't think it's probable because economic incentives don't align with doing that. But, um, but, uh, the the majority of the chain is going to be the most secure. I think the price is going to be the highest. Uh, well, just thinking relatively. about and, and Randy and I have discussed this, uh, you know, outside the show and in, in our discussions mm-hmm. about what's happening with crypto, is that when the the two chains happen, when the chain fork happens, that the the second chain or the weaker chain is going to have to meet this difficulty that it just can't oh, deal well, with. Well, that's another issue. Yes. So if all of a sudden. Uh, uh, Bitcoin Unlimited puts on the two megabyte uh, limit. Fifty one percent of all the hashing power puts on the two uh, megabyte thing. Then this uh, uh, chain fork will happen, and uh, yeah, and then the Bitcoin the core side, which is still at the one megabyte thing, that's just going to be uh, really annoying for end users to. They're going to. Ha- I mean, they might even have to go in and, and right away patch yeah. patch in an upgrade that gives them. A lower difficulty, right? And I, I think that the unless, unless, and we talked about this, unless the the breaking point, unless it happened like one or two blocks before the next adjustment, no, that wouldn't help. You wouldn't because you don't think it, because so? it's already got all those other blocks. Okay, to, so it wouldn't adjust just a little bit. But okay, it wouldn't be that extreme unless the, like the next two blocks take well, like you five wrote, hours to come. Now out. you wrote a blog post this week uh, about. Yeah. About sort of this subject. So, so yeah, I wrote a, a blog post about... At neocashradio.com. Uh, a chain <laughs> fork, which is likely, uh, I would say. Uh, uh, certainly, I, last show I called it a stalemate, and uh, that pretty much holds, but it's going to be kind of a chain fork, it, it seems like. And um, I just try to say, well, this is what it's going to be from the user's end. And uh, there, there were some questions in my mind when I wrote it because... Uh, such as the price and all of that, and I was a little hesitant to speculate on the price because uh, this is this only has a precedent of what happened with Ethereum, and so I don't think there's enough data to even say what will happen. I mean, one data point's not enough. Um, this this is a terribly contentious fork. I mean, Ethereum went through it, but uh, I think Ethereum was set up better for. A fork. I, I did Vital uh, Pedro. Maybe you know. Did Vitalik put replay protection in? Uh, I'm not sure if that went in immediately after no. the fork, but it w- it was really something they got on. Um, okay. Yes. So uh, I talk about a replay attack. In oh the, yes, it in happened the eventually, but it, it wasn't in place before the fork. Okay. Obviously, they weren't ready for it. Oh, right. well, they, yeah, not they in that thought, sense. Yeah, they right. thought they were just going to be the majority chain, and that's going right. to be the end of it. Like that with with Ethereum, though, it only took like a couple hours for the difficulty to adjust with. With um, with uh, Bitcoin, it's going to take a, at least a month for the difficulty. Right. Well, right. so what your, your what your blog post covered basically it was called so Bitcoin might fork. Here's what to expect: is that so if a hard fork happens and you have these two divergent chains uh, come out, one for Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin Unlimited, and now you have the hashing power dramatically cut. Right. It, right. It, it, so let's say side. let's say cut right. in half. More or less. Um. But, but the difficulty target hasn't been adjusted. Right. And so you talk about how that's going to take a, roughly about a month to actually shake out. Yeah. And you're going to have Bit, you know, Bitcoin Unlimited yeah. side taking about 22 minutes for blocks and the SegWit side about 18 minutes. But this was with hypothetical well, yeah, yeah. extrapolated it, it, numbers. It was reversed. But whatever had the okay. highest power, whatever, what I assumed would be 55, and I kind of pulled, pulled that number out of my rear, uh, 55% would be... Um, would be uh, uh, 18 minutes and the one with 45 would be 22 minutes. Uh, I didn't go to the extreme. Like if 75 was for unlimited and 25 was for core, it, it, it would stretch out to be um, on the core side. It would stretch out to be several months before it, it adjusts uh, well, and gets back to 10 a block every 10 minutes. So you very well may see the core and, and listeners can check to. that out at our websites. And, and Darren has had several blog posts, uh, a few blog posts recently that he's been putting out. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, the next one that happens randomly, of course. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I've been shooting for every Saturday and it was a little, little late this week. but uh, I was a slow editor. It yeah. was my fault. But everyone. I'm also wanting to get them to Randy sooner so that he has more time and doesn't have to do it all over the weekend. So, Well, what if Bitcoin Core initiated the hard fork, Darren? Well, I, imagine this is how they did it. 
Now, Bitcoin Core is looking at proof of work changes that would look to cut out Bitcoin Unlimited. Yeah, I think that's going to be a death knell for them. Because so what what they're doing is is so Bitcoin Unlimited, one of the main powerhouse behind the Bitcoin Unlimited boost in uh, hashing power is Bitmain, running Ant Pool uh, services and pools. And Bitmain pools, I mean, Bitmain has a lot. And they yeah. have 15% of the network power right now. They're building a facility that could control upwards of 45% of the network power. Uh-huh. And uh, so there's this China-based uh, mining pool. So they're looking at, and there's been uh, recent activity and talk about this and tweets and all kinds of stuff, mm-hmm. a new algorithm that would still work with it, it'd still be ASIC-friendly, but it would require a, c- a complete redesign of the current SHA-256 ASICs Rendering all of the current miners unusable. Right. That's the only way you can change the proof of work is to actually change the proof of work. Well, the CEO of BitFury is furious, to say the yes, least. Yes, yes. He launched a tirade on Twitter and threatened to sue Bitcoin Core if they were to change the proof of work algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, now imagine that they're, they're headstrong. They, this is the solution, okay? It's going to shake them all off. Anyone who's BU will not upgrade. And then when this happens, the fork happens... And those people who want this new proof of work algorithm will go off on the Bitcoin Core fork. And those, you know, with the imagine the difficulty, imagine the difficulty of Bitcoin Core going ASICless after the fork with with even half support, even fifty fifty. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't make a block for for months. Well, they might have to adjust the difficulty again for when they. Change the hashing There's a rate. lot of money invested <laughs> in mining hardware. Yeah. And yes. That's going to make a lot of people upset. That and, and I don't think that's something you can you can really do and, it, and they, immediately. Like Ethereum is is moving to you know proof and, of stake, but th- this has been on their roadmap. And yeah, everybody's known that. So there hasn't been an investment in ASICs, and of course Vitalik made it difficult. Try to make it difficult for ASICs to even exist. Can you imagine some judge trying to wrap their head around like the lawsuit with Bitfury trying to sue Bitcoin Core? I don't know. I mean. But the thing is, if there's unlimited, there'll be two end, two branches, and if unlimited, there's no talk of changing the proof of work there. Or no. At least the, I mean, if unlimited doesn't get it, they're not going to fork off. If they don't get 50% of the hash power. <laughs> That's the thing. Okay, in this case, okay, would you still call Bitcoin, BTC, if, if this fork, if, if you have to change your software or you uh, are stuck here, I mean, if you're stuck in this thing without changing software, then that's BTC. Really? My, uh, I mean, uh, uh, is I, it I still the, about the majority? I, mean, I think the My, upset miners might support, you know, the kind of... I think everyone who has an BTC. ASIC is going to jump over to the... one. The, oh, they're going to definitely jump. Because it's in there. And, and they're going to stay there, too. Yeah. They're not going to deal with this selling it for uh, the other currency and then trying to find a site that accepts it somewhere... Now, does, is this desperation on Core's part to, to talk about changing the proof I, of work algorithm, algorithm itself? So, it, so, Darren, can you explain why, if Bitcoin Core wanted to, you know, stop this, why couldn't they release a version of their software that accepts two megabyte blocks? They could do that tomorrow. Uh, they could do that, and uh, if they were trying to do that responsibly, uh, put five loads of code in there. Um, I mean, Satoshi had it in one of his things, and. Um, they would set a block in the future and say, everybody upgrade by that block. Everybody upgrades. It switches over in the future. You don't even have to worry with the... So why don't they? Mi- because... Because they're full uh, of pride. That's they're a prideful. good question. Um, what they're trying to do will raise the block limit almost up to two, but not quite. And it also sets the economic incentives a little bit weird on the fees. It, it makes it so if you have a barely huge signature, as you would on a multi-party or multi-signature transaction, then or multi-signature key, uh, then uh, that big signature that you're adding to the blockchain basically you don't have to pay a fee for. Economically, there's no uh, reason for the miner to... So if they do that around the same time, if the core sees that Unlimited is about to take over and they just release a version that supports it, and that's it, then well, they there, is no, there is no split. I would want at least two-week rollout and really... I would have done it set three years ago and had a year rollout. So, like, it's actually in the clients in between before the actual switch happens so that you don't have to, you know, oh, it, so then it, that way you can say, like, yeah, you, people you, you that didn't upgrade, upgrade point, to every version. You started would still when it's good. 0.9 and now you're on 0.11. And you, by the time you get to 0.12, you're like, oh, if you're still using 0.9, upgrade. 
And then that that's a lot easier for a network like that. Um, to- well, it, it's it's still nasty. And in fact, this last week, Bitcoin.com suffered a DDoS attack covering both its main domain and subdomains. And it's just eerily reminiscent of the Bitcoin XT days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's reminiscent of a lot of things. I remember Mt. Gox was uh, DDoSed early on. And uh, I mean, there's been a, a DDoS actor in the Bitcoin space more or less since the beginning. So we have, uh, let's see here. Might not be we the got the same one. Yeah, uh, Pedro know. wanted to talk about the S gas station. Let's jump to Ether for a moment and just change, change oh, yeah. gears. Okay. Happy thoughts. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. We're supposed to talk about the future of money. That's is that, right. Is that right? Okay. Oh, snap. Oh, snap. So, a really cool and informative uh, website I came across is uh, ETH Gas Station. So, that's uh, ethgasstation.info. Uh, so, that site is uh, an effort to increase the transparency of gas prices transaction confirmation times, and minor policies on the Ethereum network. Uh, and that's going to enable a more efficient gas market. Um, so basically, you know, gas prices... Tell me about gas. I never remember. Gas. Tell, uh, what does gas what, what, do with Ethereum? So, so gas is what you need to pay to run Ethereum contracts, to run code. And different functions have different gas prices. So one function might be five. Another one, because it takes up more cycles, is, is 20. Uh, so that encourages really efficient coding uh, and, and really tight coding. So is this meant to somehow represent computational power? Yes. Yeah, so, yes. Right. So basically, like, let's say you had to pay 100 gas to run your code. Well, you can you can now decide, like, how much gas to pay. And if you do the cheapest, uh, that might require, you know, 5 to 15 minutes before a miner will pick it up. If you do it at the cost, then you get, you know, a little more efficient. Um, it, it's going to allow more miners to participate. And then the average cost is, at this point, half of the miners are going to, you know, accept the gas. Uh, half of the top 10. Uh, so it, that's a, a good, safe average. And then you can do fastest if you really want your code to be quick. So if you run, say, um, a, an online blackjack game, well, you want, sure. you want that to run quick. So you're going to pay the fastest gas price. So it's 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 opting to, opting into a priority level for right. your yeah, computation. Yeah. yeah. So so the gas is a unit that's uh, meant to keep track of how much how computationally difficult the contract is, and then you get to pay an amount of ether per gas unit. So then and then the miner can decide how much they want for their gas. Is that yep. right? Yeah. So different miners can have uh, you know different different fees. So. Uh, they can they can then you know obviously it encourages uh, tight code and it encourages miners to be competitive because um, you know if if one miner lowers their price then you know more people are gonna you know do a lower gas price because more miners are supporting that price level. Well, wow. and this helps and gas helps prevent spam. Is that correct? That's correct because um, where in it, the real world spam does not prevent gas. <laughs> <laughs> that, that food joke for and, and just like with bitcoin you know you have to without trans any transaction costs and you know people can just you know flood flood the network wow so wow that's yes yeah, so gas is is important and i think it's it makes sense i think we recently i don't know which show we talked about how they were adjusting i think it was after the second fix from the fork the uh the uh yes the most rec- recent attack not the fork the second fix of the recent attack adjusted the gas prices for certain computational things that were lower than they should have been, which yeah, made the attack yeah. uh, actually able to, to happen. So it's something they're, they're, they're looking at. And then I think, I believe that, that miners can actually change what they're willing to accept for uh, uh, gas prices and various things. But there is a certain um, benchmark set by the foundation or the, the development team sort of thing. So... It, it is there is a free market and miners can i believe override what the foundation would recommend but um you know it, i mean some people just don't know what benchmark to go off of so yeah. it's all developing yeah so the this website shows a lot of good info it shows uh, you know gas demand the average wait time uh the gas usage you know confirmation time so it, it's it's a good little dashboard to if you're a coder and you know you want to know what it's going to cost to run your contracts this is a, a good place to look all right. Well, our next story here, uh, D- DEOS Razormine Scam Alert. Um, is that, Randy, is that something you put yeah, on the sheet? No, or, I, or I, Dara, I'm sorry. that came from me. So uh, there was an article that uh, was basically about uh, a scam. Okay. And the scam was successful in the sense that they scammed 6,000 Bitcoins. Right? Wow. So that's about $6 million. 
And uh, the, the article that's on coinidol.com is stating, and I don't really want to mention the scam because I don't want people to go there, but, um, but uh, there was an article on Cointelegraph that actually was advertising the scam. Wow. So I, I just thought that was something that, that should go on the sheet and people should know about, that uh, there is content on Cointelegraph that may not be completely fact-checked or all that. Um, I've talked with a particular public uh, um, author at Coin Telegraph, and he he says he, he he would be surprised if the Coin Telegraph people were actually doing this on purpose. He, he, the impression I got it's just very easy to print or cop, get your uh, article printed there or or published there, so that somebody might have just said, "Hey, this is neat," and did some cursory. Uh, story on it and never went and checked that it was a that, so I don't really think this is malice on coin telegraph's part but it's it's definitely a reason to be wary if people are reading coin telegraph or uh basically any news outlet in general it's it's lazy journalism it's wanting th- there's so many i mean there's there's people who want to get rich quick all the time be that with uh pump and dump investments or with getting a bunch of clicks on their article and you know getting paid to write for bigger magazines or venues as a result and so you have this economy in in the news media where getting your getting the article out first scooping other people and having your article cited and things like that you get rewarded with more page views and more clicks and all those kinds of things so uh, it's very easy to copy and paste things from press releases and misrepresent information because it looks like it's from a trusted source um, independent fact checking you know is is and can be your best friend I would definitely recommend checking all the information we share with you you know we do our we do our absolute best to find information that's available but all all of this stuff is so cutting edge and really, it, it's a matter of building trust. And so, um, you know, we we like cryptocurrencies. JJ doesn't own any. So no. he's he's the most trustworthy out yeah. of all of I, us. I, I own <laughs> zero crypto. I yeah. mean, I, I can literally, I, I had $5 in Bitcoin. And it wasn't even $5. It was like $2 and something a while ago. And then I left it sit there and the price went up and I spent it. But anyway. Um, yeah, I can ramble on further. But yeah. It, Coin, it, Cointelegraph is honestly, it, it, we've been doing the show for a while, Darren. And we've seen a lot of different uh magazines uh open up mm-hmm. and i typically do not cite coin tele- to- coin telegraph articles and i right. in fact go out of my way to look for a different source now i uh, that is not a, a, a thorough condemnation of them that's just simply saying i wouldn't i don't use them as a source typically unless it's like the only place i can find the news and for for uh you know the other the other information that backs it up is just not you know, it's not something I would link to or whatever. It does. It looks bad or whatever. Anyway, right. well, real quick on this Coin Idol thing. Yes, they have a whole sort of public trial thing they've gone around with the, these allegations. So the the supposed scam uh, that they've presented all kinds of uh, things that they're claiming evidence we'll give you for. More I, money. I didn't look more into it, but apparently this person they're alleging is a scam artist who took this six thousand Bitcoin. They said they had about a thousand dollars worth of. Bitcoin from him that he'd paid for advertisements or something, and they didn't want to return the funds to him, and so they did this whole public jury thing where they selected blockchain people to vote whether they shot, thought they should return the thousand dollars to him or donate it to charity. And I don't, I, I didn't like the whole thing. I just, I, I read through it, and it just, it's very weird. It's kind of like a public shaming thing. I mean, I guess I support reputation, of course. But it, I don't know. It just creeped me out how many people were just reaching for pitchforks and stuff. I mean, obviously, screw scam artists, but yeah. I, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's. I mean, check your facts. That's that's really the moral. Especially yeah. if you're not involved in this, just next time you read an article, you know, you maybe look for a second source. I mean, it's because not every uh, journalist will do that. And, um, uh, you know, even the mainstream journalism is getting a bit sloppy in the, these days. Truly. Uh, it, sometimes it's not fake news. Sometimes it's just bad news. How's that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Randy, uh, Chinese Central Bank. Now, we've talked about the Chinese Central Bank cracking down on Bitcoin exchanges. And uh, after the inspections that happened recently, what's going on? Yeah. So there were 
There were some halts on withdrawals we've talked about on, uh, in the past couple episodes. Basically, the three major Chinese Bitcoin exchanges have temporarily halted uh, withdrawals from their services. And now, uh, Chinese cryptocurrency exchange Huobi recently sent a letter to a number of its customers and then they were asking for these draconian customer verification declarations. Um, it was confirmed to Bitcoin.com that these customers are now being asked to provide explanations and evidence of how their Bitcoins uh, were bought, how, how they funded their accounts. And now they also want to know where your destinations are and the purposes for your withdrawals. Wow. So when, yeah. Any, uh, I'm withdrawing because I want money. <laughs> it's my money. Right. Well, not, if, in China, they want you to tell them exactly what you're going to be money, doing Darren. with it. And uh, the letter also informs the Huobi customer, customers that all of the documents and proof they submit will be sent to the National Archives where they will verify and certify its authenticity. So, like, they want copies of receipts from your bank transfers and all that kind of stuff and you send it in to them and they're uh, allegedly going to check it against I mean, this is this ex is exactly the thing that bitcoin was trying to get around this is the nuclear option and it's basically saying don't use bitcoin it, uh, like well to me it's saying don't use exchanges or <laughs> no, don't, exactly. don't store your money don't on use exchanges, exchanges. yeah that's go. that's certainly it's, i don't well, want to say don't use exchanges but don't okay, store so your who be yeah, avoid uh, it's gone it. i mean well, and it, I, I'm not. I'm not sure if we're going to see similar news from you know the other Chinese cryptocurrency exchanges, but it looks they're citing anti-money laundering regulations from uh, People's Bank of China and the Chinese right. Banking Regulatory Commission. The, 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 when all this started, that like this whole idea of having funds at a private key, that was like the one thing in the world that you could actually say is yours. Uh, there, there, I mean, you can have a book that's important to you, and you can actually own it. And nobody's going to take it from you, and you know it's not. But but if you have property, uh, you can't just use your property and like land. You can't just use it and be you know never leave it. You you've got to pay property tax no matter what you do, or they come and take it. And um, it pretty much any you know you don't even own your labor. But with Bitcoin, it's something you have full control over. Right, right. you can say I want to do this as long as you have and the private This keys. is the way I want to do it, and that's it. So, um, and if you use a brain wallet, that private key is always in yeah, your head. So, there so, you go. So it it just makes part of the world available to us again, like part of the world where you could actually own things and and decide what you want to do, and uh, and uh, 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 what they're trying to do is this control world. They're just trying to creep in on that. That's what they're they're trying to do. Um, and honestly, if I may go off sheet a little bit. Uh, uh, pay, we've got Pedro with us. I honestly think that uh, Ethereum is going to be somewhat of a solution to this because I really think that there's going to be, I don't know what type of tokens they're going to trade on there, but I really think there's going to be contracts that make tokens and there's going to be bids and asks placed as contracts on Ethereum. I don't know any reason that can't be done. And so that would set up a decentralized exchange. On, on the world computer, yeah, that's yeah. Ethereum. I mean, the buy-in would be, I don't know how you would buy in. You might find a neighbor and buy it from a neighbor. But uh, you, I think a, a world where we don't need these centralized exchange solutions that are central points of failure, I don't think we'll need those in the future because I think Ethereum or something like it will provide the tools that we need to do that. Now, um, I, I, I'm not saying that it's going to interface with every currency. Right, right. Yeah, but I don't I, I But don't there's know a potential there that you can literally yeah. run this. You can run the world computer on a protocol. I mean, that's what makes yeah. Ethereum great. And like like uh, Shapeshift, I, I mean, it, it's doing great business. I don't know if you saw. Uh, he, he, Eric has done more business in 2017 than he did in 2016. And is 2017 over? No. No, it just started. I, I did not misspeak. We've only just he's, begun. He's, he's done like double or triple what he did last year already. Right. Uh, because I think Bitcoin's having trouble. And everybody's like, I don't know what to do. I'm going to buy, you know, I'm going to change. Um, so uh, so uh, we're just, and so that was a very smart way to set it up because then it's just, okay, send it. All right, thank you, sending it. Okay, I send it back to you, send it back to you in a different form. You know, that was... You know, then you don't have to have, uh, you're not holding it for somebody or not, you're not doing it. It's just like, here's what we're agreeing to. Okay. I, you did your part. I did my part. We're done. And, and that, that's a kind of a nice thing. So I think Ethereum could maybe, uh, oracleize that. Right. Yep. Wow. Well, looking into the future of money as well, Zcash company announces the Zcash foundation, 
with a mission in, intended to, quote, give every person in the world economic freedom, unquote, the company behind Zcash is looking to create an independent, inclusive, nonprofit body to steward the technology in the interests of all users. Well, I hope they do better in the Bitcoin Foundation. Right. The uh, Zcash <laughs> Foundation looks to be that body. A portion of the Zcash Founders Reward That's will good. fund the foundation. That's great. That's the initial board of directors has been selected by Zuko Wilcox, but none of the directors are employees of Zcash Company, nor can the Zcash Company defund the foundation. Wow! So that's some good news about Zcash going forward. Yeah, that's something. Well, and it, we definitely saw the the market respond to that. I mean, Zcash has been hovering around thirty to forty dollars, and, and you can never really point to any one factor. But certainly, the price moved up to the sixty seventy dollar range uh, after this. So it seems like people agree that this is good news. People who are speculating oh, yeah. on the price of Zcash. Well, and Zuko in his blog post, which we'll have on the link uh, a link to it on our our blog neocashradio.com, that you, he, he mentions that, well, if I want to create this, as he says, quote, give every person in the world economic freedom, he goes on to describe how it, well, it's not necessarily in the interest of a for-profit company to do that. Right. right? That's so totally true. Uh, so that's why the foundation and such and such. We'll see what happens, folks. Of course, everything, you know, subject to uh, mileage may yeah. vary and change and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, Zcash is an interesting concept. They, they have, uh, we should talk about it sometime, the technical difficulty. If, if, you, if we have time, we... We can talk about it. Excellent. Talk about it, Darren. All right. So um, I, I was just listening to uh, about this. So in order for Zcash to exist, there needs to be something that, that they just called a parameter. Technically, it's a public key. And um, they had to basically make a private key. And if, if anybody got a hold of that private key, they could create Zcash. Okay. They could basically the without supply, end. Yeah, the supply could be unlimited because they could do that. what central banks do. Yeah, yeah exactly. Amazing. Exactly. So um, the way they made this private key is they had six people around the globe. We ma- talked about this, Darren. Key- oh, we did. Yeah, we, it was a video we 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 oh, mentioned. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe our b- listeners should watch that video. So we'll really, have to link back to the episode where we link really to the neat. video. But so, yeah, I so can do that. The six people they made private keys. They all go together to and then pieces so, of a private pri- key. pieces of private key. Then they put they got the corresponding public key and they put all the public keys together get one big public key and uh and that's the parameter that's and used then for the, they destroyed the private key. They, yes yes that was that the was the fun part of the video is the six different people destroyed their their part of the key and they the, didn't know which part of the key they were making they didn't know uh how how their part would be put together with the other pieces all they knew is they were making a piece and then uh the the machines were air gapped and there was a lot of steps uh, taken to make sure that uh, right once CDs were used. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, like I'd, I definitely encourage you to check out the video. It's it's pretty interesting uh, to yeah. watch. Well, we want to talk about Dash. I mean, Dash. Oh uh, yeah. It, what, what's this partnering with Charlie? We mentioned it last week, and and <laughs> tongue in cheek, um, Charlie Charlie Shrem just loves to make debit cards. I think, I think that's his yeah. calling, right? Well, uh, did he do it the first time? I, I think he he tried really, really hard. Yeah, he tried really, really hard. So, I mean, I almost hate to say it because, oh, yeah, Dash is so, doing so great, but let's be honest here. Uh, so Charlie Tram tried to have, a, he had a business that was called Ben Instant, I think. Right? Yep, that's right. And uh, he tried to issue a credit card with that. Never really happened, but he did do a lot of business with for Bitcoin, and he was one of the early kind of gateways from fiat to Bitcoin early on. So, um, so I mean, I'm not trying to say Charlie's a bad guy or anything, uh, but he did put up a proposal to the master nodes that uh, would create a uh, Dash MasterCard. Yeah. He has uh, cited the bank in the U.S. I mean, uh, he, he might use several banks, but he cited one specific bank that he's already talking, or at least in the proposal, he says he's already talking to this bank in the U.S. and it, it sounded like it's go, it's pretty much going to happen, um, but don't quote me on that. I don't know what the future will bring. Although he does have a proposal on the thing. Last I saw, it had like five yes votes and zero no votes. But I mean, it, 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 there's a good chance the master nodes will say yes to vote for this. And Just to explain to anyone who's maybe new to Dash. Uh, it's set up with a different block reward system than Bitcoin has. So 45% of the block reward goes to the miners. 45% of the block reward goes to uh, master node holders, which are mm-hmm. people who are like, uh, they've they've staked done proof of stake. They, they've staked a thousand dash and they're running a master node to collect interest, but also mm-hmm. to vote on these sorts of proposals, which are funded with the remaining 10% of the block reward. So the people who are uh, stakeholders... Uh, that have masternodes running can vote on these pr- proposals. So um, it's actually and it's actually set up as a decentralized autonomous 
organization of right. sorts. Um, so it's all just run by code. There's no central party uh, that runs these proposals. Um, so anyway, that's what he's subjected. Or he, yeah, he's turned so, something into this treasury. To yeah. So he's uh, asked for money from the Dash uh, gods, and uh, <laughs> he, he, there's a good chance he'll get it. Are they going to rain money down and, to find and him? And then uh, whether he delivers that well, remains I'll, I'll to I'll tell seen. you what. I, I, I don't know. I might have met Charlie once way back in the day at, at a Liberty Forum or something. But, um, you know, he, he, he got out of jail, and then uh, the steam, he was he, he ended up on the steam platform and just uh, rode that wave of steam, and I hope... I hope he cashed out as much as he could yeah. because I don't really know how that platform is doing these days. I don't. Know. I haven't been on it in a long time but, either. Um, he, he he is good. I mean, he's a good hype machine. He's a good like you yeah, know right. ringleader type. You know. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It's your um, money. Well, wait. One more quick story here. A wire publishes an article on predicted uh, prediction markets. Yeah, basically, I just wanted to mention sort of in, in the news. We'll, of course, link to it on neocashradio.com. But Wired put up an article today uh, called Forget Bitcoin. The blockchain could reveal what's true today and tomorrow. We've talked a little bit about prediction markets, and I think this is a really nice overview of them. Uh, there are projects out there like Augur. Um, that's based on the Ethereum blockchain. And there's a couple others, one called Bitcoin Hivemind, another called Gnosis. And essentially what you're doing is you are betting on things that are going to happen in the future, as you would do with sports or mm -hmm. anything else. Um, but this can be anything from who might win an election to what the price might be of a certain cryptocurrency or fiat currency on a certain day and time. You can put up anything you want. And basically, um, you're, if you're as... If you're correct, you get paid the the odds, and if you don't, well, then you you, and, and you not, lose And not just mining, but you can also get a lot of information to see you know what people's opinions are on thing based on you know the odds. So you, you you can get some you know data mining on. Yeah, and the when people work like this as a uh, a market, there's a, there's actually this weird effect that happens. Like you can show that it happens. You can show that significantly significant, but you can't. I don't believe it can be explained why it happens, but it's <laughs> somehow like markets seem to know stuff before people know it, you know, and with, and it's no different with these prediction markets. Uh, Maybe it's because if you have money on the line, you really research. Yeah. Well, and that's, what, that's what they're saying is that these, these have become tools that could actually help forecast the future a lot more definitively. I guess, I don't know if that's the right word for it, yeah. but by people actually putting their money where their, where their mouth is instead of, you know, the sort of experts that we have now, quote unquote, but even say meteorologists, you know, if there was something where they were financially incentivized, yep. you to know, be right. <laughs> they, they, they would fine tune their computer models and things like that. It would become, there would be an incentive to do so. Right. right. And so that, where would you want to get your weather from, from the person that has the most accurate reports? And that would be measured by uh, how many predictions they've gotten correct on this model. So it's a really interesting article and I recommend people go to neocashradio.com all the time anyway. Uh, but, so While you're there, you this link. click on this link, yeah. Right. Oh, Pedro, you've got one last story here, and it's rather interesting. Tell us about Matchpool. Uh, sure. So um, I, I just started looking into this. So it's another uh, Ethereum app. Um, so from their website, Matchpool is a decentralized matchmaking protocol which uses group dynamics to help participants match with each other. Uh, so basically their vision is to build a platform for matchmakers to allow anyone to create a community pool. Uh, it's free, and then they can invite members to, to their pool. Uh, end users of the platform, they'll be able to find connections on the app by joining pools uh, that, you know, cater their interests and, and their needs. So use cases include um, dating, uh, membership clubs, leisure and lifestyle, businesses, um, recruitment, education, and health. Wow. Now, I imagine if you factor, like, the, this is what I love uh, about looking at the future of money, and the future of our technology is you take these little parts and you integrate them with other platforms and other mechanisms, other parts. And let's say like, uh, like I've always been talking, I always talk to Open Bazaar, uh, uh, Chris Pacia, the, the lead back end developer. I always like, you should turn this into a social thing. You should turn it into a social media thing. And imagine like linking in a, a user who's selling stuff with that that sort of that sort of feature that will will allow them to link up with people who want to buy the good they're selling, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then you know I mean there's so many different possibilities where yeah, this could be layered upon something else, right? What, what, what I like about it is you know traditionally you had I want to exchange you know my my money for your goods, right? So we do this exchange. 
where you have the good and then you have the money. Well, with with things like smart contracts and you know Dash and a, a lot of the, the innovation that we're seeing in the cryptocurrency market, you, you're you're merging the two, right? So, for example, Ethereum is not just a coin of value, but is a way to run an application that gives you value, it gives you you know something that you want, and it's all bundled together. So you can do things like you know, Darren, you brought up. Um, you know, being able to bid and, you know, fund companies yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, do markets. Uh, that's all built together. You know, you have the contract with the money. Yeah, I would just love for bids and asks to be on Ethereum. You just go, I want some of that. And you just send to an address and the contract executes and sends you the token. And it'd be just like, thank you. You know, and, and then with Match Pool, you, you know, you can join pools of, you know, if you're into ham radio, you're into, you know, uh, yoga, you know, you can find local people and, you know, it, it it's completely decentralized. Yeah, um, so so I, I think this could, you know, is really good for places where uh, maybe people live under oppressive regimes um, where they might block things like Facebook or, or you know, the traditional, you know, for example, dating uh, sites. But if you have this in a protocol, then, you know, I think that brings more freedom to the world. Wow. Yeah, I guess it would. Yeah. This and something like Status, which is uh, what they're calling a mobile Ethereum OS that's being developed. Uh, it's another decentralized uh, application what? and if you take a look at dapdaily.com this was a site that Pedro had recommended recently to some friends um, and I've checked out before for for news on what's happening with uh, sort of newer decentralized applications and, and some Ethereum news uh, speaking of which ethnews.com is another great site where we get some of our info and uh, if you want some info on Dash, Dash Detailed comes out every Wednesday earlier in the day uh, before Neocash Radio we come on every Wednesday night uh, but those those have definitely been helpful for me in navigating sort of uh, some of the newer stuff. But Ethereum, so much more than a cryptocurrency as well. So l- taking a look at some of the decentralized applications that are being developed for it. Exciting times. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on, Pedro. It's always a pleasure, JJ. Well, it, for, for Neocash Radio, here's JJ. Darren. And Randy. Well, you can check out our website, neocashradio.com. We are on all kinds of different platforms. And, and YouTube, of course, was really big this week. But... Uh, please retweet all our things, right, Darren? Retweet all our things. Neocash Radio. We discuss the future of money today. 